Good morning. Good morning. Let's try again. Good morning. My name is Tron Peterson. I am the academic director for the Peter Seder Center of Advanced Study and also a professor here at UC Berkeley. I want to wish you welcome to the 10th anniversary of the Peter Seder Center for Advanced Study. This event is hybrid. Uh, so it's part of it held here in person at Berkeley and part of it held remotely in Norway and also elsewhere in California. But I'm exceptionally pleased to see so many in-person people being here because we had originally planned this event to be entirely virtual. Uh, but then we changed that plan about just a few months ago, back in June of this year, and decided to go for a hybrid event as the pandemic was receding in, in importance. I think we will have an exciting program. Um, the first part will really be just four welcome addresses. Uh, first comes the chancellor from UC Berkeley, Carol Christ. That will be by video. She is out of town today. Next comes uh, a welcome from the Associate Vice Chancellor of Research, Linda Rugg. She is here in person, so, so that's wonderful. Uh, then we have, sorry, I got the order a little bit wrong. After the Chancellor comes the Prime Minister of Norway, Jonas Gahr Støre. And uh, that will also be by video. And then comes the Vice Chancellor of uh, Research here at Berkeley, Linda Rugg, in person. And finally comes uh, the Norwegian Ambassador to the United States, Anniken Ramberg Krutnes. She's also here in person. After these uh, four welcome addresses, I will give an overview of the center, its goals, its missions, its accomplishments. And then comes it really the core part of the program, namely presentations of a selection of the research projects the center has funded over its 10 year in existence. Um, and finally, there will be some closing remarks from the pro-rector of the University of Oslo, uh, Åsa Gornitska, she's also here in person. So welcome to the celebration. Welcome to the 10th anniversary celebration of the Peter Sather Center for Advanced Study at UC Berkeley, the perfect occasion to honor and appreciate the history and importance of this wonderful collaboration between Norway and UC Berkeley. The Peter Sather Center for Advanced Study, a research collaboration between our university and Norway in collaboration with the Norwegian Research Council enables Berkeley faculty to conduct essential and exemplary research in close collaboration with leading researchers from eight Norwegian higher education institutions. Housed at the Institute for European Studies, the Peter Sather Center for Advanced Study has grown out of numerous strong and long-standing ties between Berkeley and Norway that go back to the university's earliest days. Today, the center funds and supports workshops, research meetings, joint publications, and academic exchanges. Since its founding in 2012, it has funded 273 collaborative research projects across all academic fields, from social sciences and humanities to arts, physics, engineering, and more, distributing around $5.6 million in supportive funding. The center's namesake, Norwegian-born Peter Sather, was one of Berkeley's founding fathers. A philanthropist, an ardent supporter of public education, he was born in Norway in 1810 and emigrated to the United States in 1832. In 1860, he was elected member of the Board of Trustees of the College of California in Oakland, the predecessor of the University of California, Berkeley, the first university in our state. These are among the reasons the Sather name and legacy are honored by two of our most recognized landmarks, Sather Gate and the Sather Tower, also known as the Campanile. With all that in mind, we could not be prouder to count the Norwegian Crown Prince among our distinguished alumni, His Royal Highness, 
Håkon Magnus received his undergraduate degree in political science from UC Berkeley in 1999. To this day, we host many visiting Norwegian students, faculty, and scholars. Our Department of Scandinavian Studies is highly distinguished, and just recently, Berkeley has opened a new Nordic Center, which aims to further elevate the profile of and grow in global interest in the Nordic countries, including Norway. During this semester alone, our community includes 144 Norwegian students and scholars, 108 of whom are visiting students through the Berkeley International Studies Program, which has served almost 3,000 visiting Norwegian students over the past 20 years. We're grateful for all that our partnership has produced in the past and excited about what our future together holds. Thank you for joining us to celebrate this momentous occasion and for your support in furthering collaboration between UC Berkeley and Norway. More than 14 years ago, I learned about Professor Liv Dusun's efforts to establish a Norwegian center at the University of California, Berkeley. Back then, I was Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway, and I was happy to give her my full support. I am so delighted to say that this year we are celebrating a decade of success for the Peder Seter Center for Advanced Study at UC Berkeley. The primary aim of the center is to advance scholarship and encourage dynamic exchange among faculty and students and thus strengthen the links between the United States and Norway. The results of this collaboration with Norwegian universities and UC Berkeley has surpassed the expectations. I'm so happy to see that. During these 10 years, about 255 research projects have been conducted and the research has been within the broad scales of fields. These achievements would never have been made possible if it were not for Professor Liv Duesen. UC Berkeley is one of the world's top universities and unlike most in its league, it is public. Equality and inclusion are cornerstones for the Norwegian government's way of thinking. It is quite suitable that the first Norwegian center at an elite university is located at Berkeley. The name of the center is an homage to Peder Seter, a Norwegian-American banker who was eager supporter of public education for both men and women, regardless of race. A man who believed in equality and inclusion, a truly visionary man. Today, ten fruitful years have passed since Peder Seter Center was founded, and the partner universities have agreed to continue this collaboration. The work and the journey continue, and I'm so happy to see that. I want to close with the same words as I did in my letter to Professor Duesen 14 years ago. I wish you every success in your endeavors. Good morning. A warm welcome to our guests from Norway. I see that Norway is the ambassador to America. Good morning and welcome to all of you particularly our esteemed Norwegian guests and the Honorable Ambassador to the United States from Norway. I think I was probably invited because I have a fancy title. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research. Um, but I actually, I'm more interested to be here as a professor <laughs> in the Scandinavian department uh, at UC Berkeley. I'm particularly grateful to be in your company on this occasion. Um, in my studies of the Nordic region, I became acquainted with the history and culture, of course, and the landscape of Norway, um, as well as Norway's history with Berkeley, which makes your presence and your gift so much more meaningful. It was not very long ago, probably within the lifetime of some of our Norwegian guests' grandparents, that Norway was a very poor country. It was poor in economic terms, in any case. The rocky landscape of mountains and fjords the forests and the Arctic islands make for a breathtakingly rich environment, but it was difficult to scratch out a living there. Hundreds of thousands of Norwegians felt forced to leave their country to make a living elsewhere, including Peter Seather, who came from a poor family to the United States where he made a fortune and ended up in the Golden State of California. 
That fortune, as you've already heard, uh, provided some of the seeds for the flowering of our university and erected our most memorable landmarks, the Sather Gate and the Campanile. Every kid on this campus knows the name Sather. They don't know who he is, but they know the name. They mispronounce it, they mispronounce it, but they know it. <laughs> okay, generations later, Norway, of course, found its own fortune in North Sea oil. As Nordic tradition and culture demanded, the wealth was not limited to a few people, but spread across the population and held in trust for them so that a once poor country became one of the world's most prosperous. And what is the best thing to do with wealth? Under the le leadership of Liv Duesen, whom we've already mentioned, has already been mentioned, uh, who had studied the history uh, of Peter Sather, the Norwegians decided to use some of this wealth to plant seeds, once again in California, to create partnerships and, cre and to increase understanding and knowledge so that together we can find ways to address the problems of ignorance and poverty and find other means besides oil to fuel our endeavors so that the world will continue to be our breathtakingly beautiful home. For the past 10 years, in the name and tradition of Peter Sather, um, Norway has shared its wealth with us and we have shared our ideas and passion with Norway. Our little department, the Scandinavian department, has always had close ties to colleagues in Norway. We visited back and forth, and uh, Leif was our guest, <laughs> uh, working on conferences and projects, articles and books. We were even privileged, as was mentioned earlier, <clears throat> uh, to have uh, Crown Prince Holkan among us. Um, he could have followed other royalty and chosen a private institution like the one to the south of here, but he came to Berkeley, and in fact, uh, he even was present in my colleague Mark Sandberg's uh, course on the plays of Henrik Ibsen. But the Pater Sather grants opened the door for all of UC Berkeley researchers to, sh to, uh, go to, to go to Norway and to share ideas and projects with their Norwegian counterparts. There have been grants in human rights and immigration studies, energy and environmental studies, arts and disability studies, sustainable business, data-driven social science, and much more. The generosity of our partner Norwegian institutions has produced a great flowering of scholarship across this decade. And we look forward in anticipation uh, to the decades to come. Tusen, tusen tak. Thank you so much. Good morning and, and good evening to those back in Norway. Um, dear friends, I'm so pleased to be here to celebrate the 10th anniversary of uh, the Peter Sater Center. As we heard, the center is named after Peter Sater, uh, who was a farmer's son from Norway and emigrated to the US in 1832 and became a founding father of US Berkeley. What a journey that must have been. And Peter Sater was one of the many who emigrated from Norway to the US. 800,000 Norwegians emigrated. It was close to a third of the population. There's a very, very strong Norwegian-American community here in the US. Among the Nordics, Norway is the biggest population here. That was the start of a very strong Norwegian-American relationship, a relationship that we have seen grow, evolve, in many areas. Um, we stand together in the Second World War. After the Second World War, we founded NATO together. And today, we stand together in the fight for democracy in Europe. Um, and we stand together in the fight for Ukraine. Um, Norway has a particular role, as all of us have. Uh, but we are, as we say, we are NATO's ears and eyes in the north. We share a border with Russia, we have a very long Atlantic coastline, and we keep an eye on what's going on there. And right now we are also Europe's most important provider of energy. But security policy, that brings us together, and the transatlantic relationship is stronger and more important than ever. That um, is a result of all the other relations we share. Security policy does not operate in a vacuum. 
It comes because we share values, we share history, we share relations. And one of the finest examples of the relationship between Norway and US is exactly this. That's what's going on here on Berkeley, where we work together on important research and how to shape the future. I'm very proud as Norway's ambassador to the US that Norway has such a strong footprint at one of the finest institutions in the US. We've heard about all the projects. I'm not going to list numbers or names because others have already done it. But I will say I'm looking forward to the rest of the day where we will have some insight in the research that is going on. Looking back, we see the rewarding effects from the establishment of this center and looking forward. I hope that the next 10 years and the next 10 will prove equally, if not even more beneficial on all these level of impacts. I'm also happy to note um, the new opportunities for further collaboration uh, that emerged between Norway and the US. And I just will mention that we have a memory of understanding between the Department of Energy here in the US and the Ministry of Education and Research in Norway, an MOU on artificial intelligence. And I hope that MOU will be filled with a lot of content and I see you as important contributors to that. Given US Berkeley's role in AI research, again, you have to fill that MOU with the content. And with that, I would just conclude by congratulating all of you, everyone who is associated with the Peter Center on your 10 year anniversary. And may we meet again in a decade and in two, in many more to come. Congratulations. So in, in the next uh, seven to eight minutes, I will get, going to tell you a little bit about the long-standing connections between UC Berkeley and Norway. Some of it you have already heard, but it's worth repeating. It's uh, good stuff. Um, and I'm going to cover three points. First, the founding of the university. Next, Norwegian students at UC Berkeley. And then finally, the Peter Seder Center which is kind of the zenith of these uh, collaborations. So let me start with the founding of the university. Peter Seder was born in Udalen, 1832, came to the US. No, sorry, born in 1810, came to the US in 1832, and then to California in 1851. When he came to California, we had the gold rush. So everyone was focused on gold and gold mines. Seder, on the other hand, he was a true visionary. And he sort of peeked into the future. And his thinking was like this. Human minds are more important than gold mines. And he saw that the future of the world would depend crucially on research and education. So for that reason, we have here the main entrance to the university, the Seder Gate, and then the main uh, other landmark on the university, the Seder Tower, both named after him. But there's also professorships, several in history, classics, and others that are named after him. And all of this was funded by the inheritance he left behind when he passed away in 1886. So I think it's correct to say that not no single person has left as strong an imprint on UC Berkeley as Peter Seder did. I think it is also correct to say that no Norwegian has left such a strong imprint abroad on a major university as Peter Seder did. And fittingly, we then have the illustrious Department of Scandinavian Studies here 
at Berkeley, which also covers uh, Norway, a Norwegian language and culture. And fittingly, we are a public university, which is what a lot of Norwegian institutions are. For all these reasons, we decided to name the new center the Peter Seder Center for Study. If you want to learn more about Peter Seder, this is the book to read. It's written by the Norwegian Karin Sveen, The Immigrant and the University, Peter Seder and the Gold Rush. Uh, there's also an earlier Norwegian version of it, but the English version is quite a bit more extensive. Let me turn to my second point, namely Norwegian visiting students at UC Berkeley. Uh, Norway has extensive collaborations with UC Berkeley for sending students here for sort of what we call del studier in utlandet or partial studies abroad. And uh, since about 2005, we had had about 3,000 such students coming here in lots of different fields. They've gone back to Norway and then done further studies there. We've also had during the summer uh, several students coming here, roughly 500 over a 12-year period, who do uh, study innovation and entrepreneurship and uh, work in internships. So these students, they're here for a semester, sometimes two semesters. They take classes. Some are in internships in schools and in other organizations in the area. And then, as I said, they go back to Norway for further study. And here you can see the picture. It's a Norwegian, Norwegian crown prince, prince pouring, pouring coffee, coffee to one, one of the visiting students. students. And uh, uh, I'm also very pleased to say that, that this particular, particular visiting student here um, came here first as a master's student, student, then came back as a PhD student, student then later on as a postdoc, and, and has returned, returned to Norway, has, has just, just been appointed, appointed a professor at the University of Oslo, of Oslo and is here with us today, and, and will present a little bit on what all the things he did, Magnar Ødegård. So you will hear from him soon. Then, then to, to the, the Peter Seder Center. So with this long history between UC Berkeley and Norway, it all became natural. We need also to have some extensive and formalized research collaboration. And what exactly does the center do? Let me tell you. But first, I want to give a brief genesis of its history. The work for establishing the center started really in late 2000s, when Professor Liv Duesen took the initiative and developed the ideas. Her work completed in 2011 and 2012. Then we opened the center in um, 2012, in October. At that time, eight Norwegian institutions had joined the center. The Research Council of Norway had given some partial funding. We had a bid opening here on campus. Our chancellor, Bergenau, gave a welcome address. Our then Prime Minister of Norway, Jens Stoltenberg, gave a welcome address as well. He is now the head of NATO. So it was quite a, quite a big event. Now, as you know, the center is really a research collaboration between faculty here at UC Berkeley and faculty at these eight institutions in Norway. But it also includes many masters and PhD students that are part of the funded projects. So they come here, work with faculty from Norway and faculty from Berkeley as masters and PhD students. And over the last 10 years, we have funded 273 collaborative research projects, distributed about $5.6 million. It's across practically every field imaginable, you know, from arts, music, dance, to social sciences, Humanities, physics, engineering, mathematics, and so on. There's really no limitations on it. The way it primarily works is that we give small grants, typically of $25,000, and then um, people find out how to develop their ideas from this. And I think I could say that several hundred masters and 
a large number of PhD theses have been completed in part as part of these collaborations. Uh, the main sort of, um, say, major, major sort of important thing that's happened out of this are really the intellectual exchanges. But it has also had spin-offs in other directions. And by our estimate, for every dollar invested by the center in collaborative research project has spun off an additional four dollars. And um, so this comes in additional to the intellectual payoff. And these ad additional four dollars that every dollar gets sort of comes from research foundations in Norway, in Europe, in the United States, and elsewhere. So the center typically runs seminars, workshops, facilitates uh, experiments, data collection, co-authoring, and it also does development of teaching at the undergraduate and graduate level. So we do studies and, and seminars of that. Um, I say, you name it, the center does it. And in a few minutes, you will hear from some of these projects. What I would say is that Many, really many of the collaborations have been very successful. And some of them have been really also instrumental in establishing so-called centers for research excellence in Norway. They're funded by the Norwegian Research Council. By my, my count, at least four such, uh, the Seder Center has been part of the establishing four such centers in very, very diverse fields. And it has also facilitated extensive exchanges of masters, PhDs, and postdocs between Norway and Berkeley, going from Norway to Berkeley and the other way. And the picture behind me is from some of the early days of the Peter Seder Center. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, here uh, some of the participants at that point in time. So thank you for your attention and welcome to the celebration. Hello, my name is Akasemi Newsom, and I'm executive director of the Peter Sather Center here at UC Berkeley. We'll now turn to the research showcase where we're proud to feature highlights from 10 years of academic collaboration. Our first presentation will be by Heidi Wig, professor at, the, um, Biz, at BI in uh, Norway. Uh, Robin Marsh, a professor at UC Berkeley, Alastair Iles, a uh, professor also at UC Berkeley, and their project is titled Models of Sustainable Farming and Adaptive Responses to a Global Pandemic in Different Geographical Contexts. Uh, my name, as I said, is Heidi Dijk. I'm a professor in innovation and entrepreneurship at um, BR, the Norwegian Business School. And my first question, of course, is that, do you see my screen? No. Hi, Heidi. Hi. I can try to share my screen again. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Good. And then also in the right mode? Looks like it. Okay, very good. 
So did you hear what I just said? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So I am, yes. So I will leave the word to, to Robin for the first slides and then I will come back to you. And Robin, you just have to tell me when to, to switch. Good. Um, well, greetings to everyone. And I, first off, I, I want to say how much I enjoyed the four introductory remarks. They were very touching, and I feel ever more motivated to be a researcher with the Peter Saylor Center. So thank you for those. Um, I'm Robin Marsh. I'm with the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, ISSI, here at UC Berkeley. I'm an agricultural economist, and I, for many years, have worked on research at the nexus of agriculture, environment, and rural livelihoods, as I do with my colleagues, as you will see. Um, before we go on to the slides, I wanted to recognize Professor Alistair Isles of ESPM, Environmental Science Policy and Management, who's been a great advisor on many of our projects, but couldn't be here today. So let's start with the first slide, um, Heidi. Yes. So? Well, as you can see from this slide, our journey with Pierre Tessette began in 2015, when my colleague, Professor Inger Marin from the University of Bergen, was doing a Fulbright here at ISSI at my institute. And we have worked together ever since building on this relationship and expanding to other partners. You'll know that there's going to be a lot more text than I have to go after, you know, I can go through because we have very short time. Um, but let's go, let's go to the next slide. So our research, which has resulted in numerous publications, has focused on comparing practices of sustainable agriculture and socioecological resilience in food systems faced with crises and shocks, such as the 2015 earthquake in Nepal and recently with COVID-19. Our current grant with the University of Bergen postdoc, Alicia Baraclo, looks at generational renewal strategies in rural California and Spain, both territories faced with an aging farmer population. And Berkeley and Norwegian students are among the co-authors on nearly all of our publications. So let's go to the next one. So we're just going to, I'm just going to talk for a minute or two about one of our latest research collaborations. And that is the one um, dealing, comparing the impacts and adaptive responses to the COVID-19 pandemic on farmers and farm support organizations in California, Norway, and China. The results were published recently in the journal Frontiers in Sustainable Food Systems. And our expansion to China was possible through the Norwegian Business School's partnership with Duke Gulshan University outside of Shanghai. So you're seeing how we're expanding our partnerships over time. So drawing from in-depth interviews with farmers and government and non-governmental support organizations, we mapped the vulnerability and resiliency of selected farmers to shocks that severely disrupted traditional supply chains in three different sociopolitical systems. We looked at what we could consider market-dominated food systems in California. We, could look, we looked at Norway, which has a social contract to support um, small farmers. And then we looked at Southeast China, which is a more government-controlled food system. And some of our, next slide, some of our conclusions. The data show commonalities for several of the adaptive responses to the global pandemic, despite very distinct sociopolitical systems. So these may seem familiar to you because, of course, we're still living through this pandemic. What have been the responses? A sharp rise in e-commerce, increased direct and diversified markets to consumers, changes in social norms. For instance, rekindling of community traditions we found very strong in Norway. Crucial government emergency and recovery support and complementary support by NGOs and the private sector to farmers where government support was lacking. All hands on deck really kept 
the crisis from getting worse for our food systems. These findings have led to a series of recommendations on how to strengthen resiliency of local and global food systems to shocks in the future. Take it away, Heidi. Thank you so much, Robin. So I will highlight um, some of the collaborations uh, that we have had and the lessons uh, learned. And it has been then seven years uh, of engaging in projects and also six different projects. And through that, strong personal ties and working relationships have come out of it with the principal researchers in the different projects, which has led to, as you just saw, several published papers, also with the students as co-authors. And the expansions that we have included is not only geographical expansion through our collaboration also now with several institutions in Norway, but also in, in China and other countries, has kept our research relatively fresh with new research questions adding to it. We have also had success in, in raising complementary funds, as also Trun Petersen mentioned, both from the Nordic Center at Fudan University in Shanghai, or which BI collaborates strongly with, from Fulbright and from the social science metric research. Our collaboration continues also into larger projects, now one also funded by University of Bergen. And yesterday I had a meeting with the Norwegian Research Council, also very interested in the findings that we had in the last paper just mentioned by, by Robin. Peter Setter also, I mean, through these projects, we have engaged students in very different paths of their careers to become researchers. We have included undergraduate research apprentice program at UC Berkeley with 14 Europe students. They have been engaged in field research. We have introduced mixed research methods for them. And also, as mentioned, they have been taking part in, in publications. One minute. One minute. Okay. Um, we have also included graduate students uh, as assistants, both from UC Berkeley, from the University of Bergen, and also from Duke Kanchen University outside Shanghai. Some of our students had after ended projects with the Peter Center pursued PhDs and, and still are working together with us on the different, different projects, research projects. And we also engage postdoc students. And one of the postdoc students is now actually also a principal investigator in the latest Peter Center grant that we just have received. So this is the impressive list of, of people uh, that have been part of the research projects funded by the PD Center Center. Here are the list of all the students that have been, been part of it through the years and also principal faculty. Representing both professors at UC Berkeley, at University of Bergen, at uh, BI, at Duke Concern University and, and other places. So well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin, and the rest of the team. We will now have a project titled Rationality in Dynamic and Strategic Settings. The PIs were Alexander Kaplan from NHH Business School in Norway and Professor Shakar Kariv at UC Berkeley. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I, I'm Shakar, and I'm losing my voice, as you can see. Uh, don't worry, I don't have COVID. My wife left on a work trip, and whenever she goes, I'm becoming sick. It's, it's purely psychosomatic. Uh, I also, uh, I actually have to leave right after, so I apologize for a school 
uh, like a week-long boot camp that we are doing for PhD students together with the folks from NHH. And this time we are hosting it in, uh, in UC San Diego. So I'll need to fly to San Diego. Um, so, uh, so what are we doing? We actually started, I understand that I need to stand here. Uh, we actually started our collaboration even before the Peter Center, uh, the Peter Seder Center started. It was a collaboration between the Choice Lab at the Norwegian School of Economics and our experimental laboratory, X Lab. Uh, and with funding from the Peter, uh, Peter Seder Center, uh, we were also able to apply uh, for a center of excellence uh, from the Research Council of Norway. Uh, my Norwegian friends tell me that this was the first center in the social sciences. Uh, I don't know, I put wide confidence intervals on what economists say, including myself, so I hope it's true. Uh, but it has, been a very, uh, it has been a very fruitful collaboration and, uh, and we are continuing and the center is called FAIR, which is actually exactly the, uh, the core topic which uh, we are studying. So uh, whenever I talk about it, I invite people to argue with me, but because we have only seven minutes and I have very little voice, so you cannot argue with me. So when we are talking about rationality, uh, we are talking about mainly about rationality in what we call the three fundamental trade-offs in life. And I would argue that you, know, you need to make many decisions in life. Life is an infinite sequence of decision. Financial decisions, non-financial decisions, decisions at home, decisions at work. But we argue, when I say we, the people in decision theory and game theory, we argue that all of these decisions are actually governed by three trade-offs. We call them the three fundamental trade-offs in life. The trade-offs between risk versus return, should I put my money in bonds or should I put my money in stocks? Stocks have a higher expected return, but they can also go down as we see today. The trade-off between today and tomorrow, meaning my welfare today versus my welfare tomorrow. Should I buy this car or save more for my retirement? Should I eat this cheesecake or stay with the salad? Should I go to the gym or stay on a couch, etc., etc., you can see. And also the trade-offs between self and others, meaning the trade-offs between my own well-being and the well-being of other people. The other people can be my children. How much money should I leave to them after I'm gone? But other people can be the environment or it can be about taxation and redistribution. And our research is to understand how people are solving these trade-offs in dynamic settings. So I will focus on what we call actually distributional preferences. Distributional preferences are a type of trade-off between self and other, where other, following a long tradition in philosophy, the other is a random other in society, an unknown other. And we believe, or at least we would like to think, that our views about taxation and redistribution is governed by our distributional preferences. Am I willing to be taxed more in order to give to a random other American? Now, this type of distributional preferences, this is not something that economists, of course, invented. Uh, it, uh, this type of distributional preferences are divided uh, into two parts. The first part is the weight that I put on myself versus the other person. It means how impartial I am. The other trade-off is the trade-off between equality and efficiency. And these are two separate trade-offs as the long and known debate between John Rawls of Princeton and John Harsani from Berkeley. Both of them actually advocated for choices for theories of fairness that people are doing behind the veil of ignorance, which mean people have to be impartial. People have to put equal weight on themselves and other people. But they, of course, disagreed about uh, what should be the trade-off between equality versus efficiency. If you like economics and you know indifference curves, uh, Harsani will have linear indifference curves because he had extreme concerns about efficiency. And Rawls had extreme concerns about equality, so he is going to have the Leon TF. But both of them are fair-minded because they are putting equal weight on themselves and other people. Now, of course, this also translates to uh, political agendas in the United States. 
Uh, and elsewhere, of course, we typically associate the Democratic Party with policies that are more towards equality, higher taxation and redistribution, and the Republican Party uh, to policies that are actually about uh, increasing efficiency, reducing taxes, and promoting economic growth. But, you know, I think it would be hard to argue that uh, Democrats are more fair-minded than Republicans or vice versa. All right, so uh, here is just one piece of evidence uh, that we have from a paper that we published in Science in 2014, where we actually using uh, experimental game theory, we measure the distributional preferences of three groups. One is what is called the American Life Panel. This is a representative sample of Americans, one of the best research panels that we have in the United States. The other is, whew, pressure. <laughs> the other is, uh, the other is Berkeley undergraduate. And finally, these are Yale Law School students, which of course, if you understand American politics, uh, they have a large influence on American politics. And we divide people into uh, fair-minded, intermediate, and selfish. And the gray and blue lines are about whether they are more towards equality or more towards efficiency. And you can actually see that the elites that make decisions are much more selfish and much more concerned about efficiency. So I'll just conclude with a discussion between Scott Fitzgerald and Ernst Hemingway where uh, Fitzgerald basically said to, uh, uh, to Hemingway that the elite is different than us. Uh, and Fitzgerald basically replied that yes, they have more money. And this actually shows that there is more than this. All right, thank you. Testing. We will now have a presentation that's pre-recorded titled User Experience Wilderness, Rethinking User Experience, Holding Capacity and Public-Private Relations Hips Along Scenic Roadways in California and Norway. Uh, the PIs for this project are Professor Jorg Siewicke from NMBU in Norway and Professor Richard Hindle at UC Berkeley. Thank you for the opportunity to present at this 10th anniversary event. Our project, Wilderness User Interface, initiates research on the subject of wilderness experiences, public space, and scenic roadway infrastructure in California and Norway. The topic is timely as California's population rapidly approaches 40 million and pressures on roadways, public lands, and wilderness reach capacity. In Norway, similar trends in consumption of wilderness experiences are observed the cultural norms and investment in public infrastructure offer a distinct counterpoint to the United States. Both California and Norway boast generous scenic roadways and public infrastructure, providing access to wilderness for auto-dependent tourists. However, many wilderness areas in California now have regular influx of visitors, necessitating reservation systems and controlled parking. And in Norway, bottlenecks and overcrowding in small villages test the limits of infrastructure. Wilderness areas must now also address new types of user experience, including social media, that change the way wilderness areas are inhabited and consumed. The cultural differences between the United States and Norway are interesting to consider. The Allemannstraten, the right to roam, grants free movement across public and private property. It prioritizes unrestricted movement through the Norwegian landscape above the property rights of a few. In the United States, private property rights and no trespassing maintain the integrity of personal property 
protecting the domains of a few from physical interference, intrusion, and public use. These two concepts um, provide context for our study. In Big Sur, the patchwork of public and private lands change the way that infrastructure change the way that wilderness is conceived. As we move through the scenic roadway of routes highway 101 for example we cross public and private domains which limit public access to this wilderness area in both countries these freedoms and rights are being compromised due to the holding capacity of tourist infrastructure in practice this means wilderness is increasingly challenged and exploited by increased tourist numbers testing the limits of infrastructure facilities in large landscapes in essence, the introduction of tourist infrastructure is not a neutral act. For example, in California at Bixby Bridge, an iconic landmark where visitor usage exceeds the capacity of tourist infrastructure, this publicly accessible site traverses public land holdings, leading to tension with landowners and visitors. Earlier this year in June, we explored three out of 18 national tourist routes, beginning in the Arctic Circle with Senya, Andoya, and the Lofoten Island. We were taking a round trip from Tromsø and uh, explored every single project on these routes. Bukukiaka stands out by an exquisite design conducted by Morphosis architects. This project provides visual clues and framing the landscape, but also functions as an invitation to access the trailhead. One of the things we learned on this trip is in how far the added value of these projects is really how they begin to provide a sense of orientation and identity of this vast landscape around them. Bukkerka combines the significance of a significant geolo geological site, the history of a lost fishing village, and a Sami sacred site. Recently, the construction of a spaceport project just north of this rest stop site is challenging the project's integrity. The National Tourist Route Administration shared their concerns in an interview that they may withdraw the status of a national tourist route from the Andoya section entirely, as they feel that the landscape is compromised rather than enhanced by this spaceport project. This is due to a number of security issues require distances and road closures that go along this project. However, we um, pose the question of what type of infrastructural projects qualify to enhance the landscape experience and what other character and scale of infrastructure, for example, wind parks, or bridges would not qualify or actually compromise that experience as has been voiced in this interview. And um, we can look at a number of projects throughout the US where such large scale infrastructural interventions like this wind farm or the Hoover Dam are actually historic moments that clearly contribute to um, the experience of such landscape.
Our inquiry has been productive, and we're excited to offer at UC Berkeley a new course in landscape architecture, Detours in Detail. The studio course will explore design opportunities along scenic highways and byways. Participants will road trip, camp, analyze, and redesign segments of an iconic American roadway, American roadway in Big Sur, California. Each student will develop a project that challenges concepts of public-private space through detailed site proposals for rest, observation, access, and habitation, and infrastructure in this wilderness area. In terms of feedback, and we would like to suggest that guidelines for UC Berkeley departments and staff be developed on how to hire Norwegian students and research assistants, therefore um, facilitating collaboration and also a streamlined process for sharing funds between institutions. We thank you very much for your support and wish you continued success over the next decade. Our next presentation will be purely on Zoom. The project is titled Autonomous Docking for Marine Vessels. Professor Askir Sørensen from NTNU in Norway is the PI, and Professor Murat Arkak from UC Berkeley is also a PI. Ask you start, correct, and then I, I will take over. That's okay. Dear friends, uh, good morning in the US and good afternoon in, in Norway. I think we can, uh, I will start with the, to, to also make some remarks about where does collaboration really starts. And I think the interaction with Murat started already at the very late part of his uh, PhD, where he was also in contact with other PhDs and uh, PIs in Norway. That was in, in particular my colleague Turinge Fossen and uh, some of his group of students. And uh, then I was also brought into this uh, collaboration. And uh, Murat has been a, a member of PhD committees uh, in Atenta NU for years, uh, both at the uh, Department of Engineering Cybernetics and Department of Marine Technology. And uh, I think it was when the Kronprins Håkon was visiting uh, Berkeley in 2011, we also more or less uh, related to that visit. It was also a part of Science Transatlantic Week. We also decided that the Murat should be a member of uh, or collaborator also in our Center of Excellence uh, on uh, Autonomous Marine Operations and Systems, where I also engaged Murat as a part, uh, a member of the Scientific Advisory Board. And uh, since then, uh, we have also had uh, regular visits. Uh, Murat uh, and uh, myself has been going uh, both ways, and we have also been sending students uh, both ways. And uh, I was also lucky to be at the sabbatical leave uh, at UC Berkeley for uh, 2017, and where we actually fed uh, or created a lot of new ideas that was uh, brought into uh, Amos, but also to other project proposals we will uh, come back on. And, I, and we, I think we can see and regard and appreciate Peter Sader grant uh, that has really contributed as uh, instrumental in order to get this going. So uh, this has uh, resulted in a lot of joint publications and hopefully we create new Murats and new Oscars that will take this over after, uh, after us. So Murat, please take the next. Sure. So um, regarding the particular project we are summarizing. So the idea here was to merge tools from control theory and formal methods for software and hardware verification for verifying the correct behavior um, and safety of autonomous marine vehicles. So as a challenge application, we selected docking maneuvers because Oscar said this is a high risk operation and still manually um, uh, conducted very often because of the you know, collision risk and the strict requirements for precision. So how do we automate that? How can we do this autonomously? So several results came out of this and Oscar was referring to future Oscars and future Murat. So I think 
two of those emerged from this. So our postdocs, Pierre-Jean Mayer and Astrid Brodkopt um, collaborated on this. And there's a joint publication by the two. Most importantly, they have both started their own careers. Astrid is a faculty in, um, at NTNU and Pierre-Jean is in France and they continue to work together. So um, the theoretical ideas were developed um, early in the project. Uh, part of the project was to be experimental, but then the pandemic got in the way. So we have nevertheless picked up from where we had stopped. So once things opened up, um, Kate Schweidel from my group has been visiting NTNU. In fact, she was there last week uh, working on the experiments. In the meantime, we also hosted Jens from uh, Oscar's research group. Uh, that was also unfortunately cut a little short because of COVID. He had to return home. That was spring 2020. Nevertheless, we were able to you know, summarize the results of his visit in a publication. So, and I was also able to resume my annual visits to NTNU uh, this past May. It was a wonderful trip as always. And we also went to the Arctic, to Svalbard, and were engaged in some experiments over there. It was an amazing experience. So, and I'm happy to also report that we'll, we are able to bring Oscar back uh, fall 2023. He'll be again on sabbatical here. Um, on, on the, you know, in closing, I want to also mention some of the, um, the how we leverage this or how the Peter Sadler grant was able to it was able to you know leverage uh, some of our efforts. Maybe the first bullet you can uh, talk about Oscar, and I'll switch to the second later. Yes, uh, we we have uh, also as a part of or you could say a continuation of. Uh, uh, and then uh, Amos also created a new program uh, on autonomous robotic operation subsea, uh, where uh, where we have now uh, five uh, PhDs, uh, no six PhDs and three postdocs, and where also Murat is uh, involved uh, again as a member of the scientific advisory board, and where we also are considering uh, exchange of students, and uh, this will be a part of uh, you could say my. Next day at Berkeley will be actually to follow up uh, that part. Mm -hmm. And on the second bullet, we have a very closely related project that has just been funded by the National Science Foundation from the Cyber Physical Systems Program. It's a frontier project of uh, four PIs from various institutions, um, total about 5.6 million over four years. So uh, Oscar was instrumental as an international collaborator. And we will make use of the test beds at NTNU for applying the autonomy ideas to autonomous um, marine vessels. And during Oscar's visit here next fall, we'll be able to engage him more in this project. And the great benefit of that will be that there are other universities involved and Oscar will be able to visit them and their industry partners and he will be able to make connections. So. And that will strengthen the ties between not just UC Berkeley, but other universities and Norway. I may also add one comment uh, here is that, uh, as you see, what we, we have, we are working on fundamental research at both Berkeley and NTNU, but what we really also try is also to bring this into applications. And here we are also learning from automotive industry and take that learning back to the maritime industry and hopefully also opposite. So. So this is also happening around us. So we become a part of an ecosystem. So, so thank you. And thank you, Oscar, for uh, the, joining at these odd hours. Oscar also joined in our reverse site visit by NSF. And that was really, really late at night in Norway. But he was there to support us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next presentation is titled Comparative Multimodal Neurocognition Experiments for Enhanced Engineering Design Research. And we'll feature the PIs, Professor Martin Steinert from NTNU, Professor Enrica Dubvik from NTNU, and our own Professor Kosa Gutscher Lambert from UC Berkeley. Thank you.
Great. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So I'm Kosa Doucher Lambert. I'm assistant professor in mechanical engineering here at UC Berkeley. Uh, it's been really great to learn about more of the work from the center. Um, so this is a collaborative project between UC Berkeley and NTNU. Um, and then uh, Professor Martin Steinert's over on Zoom somewhere. So maybe if you're on Zoom, you can see him wave um, and say hello. Okay, so what this project is about is really the blending of cognitive neuroscience and engineering design. Uh, so for some time now, we've been interested in studying uh, using non-invasive brain imaging techniques to study designers' minds while they're coming up with new ideas. And so the idea here is that we want to study how people generate these creative concepts using these non-invasive technologies and then use those insights to then create new design theories and methods and technologies to help people generate better ideas. So <clears throat> when we started doing this work a um, long time ago, I was using fMRI, uh, which is in the bottom left-hand picture. And if you've been in an MRI machine before, you know it's really loud, you're strapped down. Um, and maybe not the best environment to come up with these creative ideas. Um, so, you, you know, you can, we learn a lot about really nice spatial resolution of the brain, so we get really great pictures and images, but it's not a very naturalistic environment to study these phenomena. And so the idea for our, uh, for our grant here was that we wanted to transition into more naturalistic settings. So we wanted to look at different modalities of capturing information about people's minds and thinking. Uh, so using, uh, again, uh, FNIRS, which is another technology, and EEG, as well as some other cool stuff like eye tracking to study similar, similar things. Okay, so, and yes, so some of the things related to design behavior that we're looking at involve uh, creativity, how innovative ideas are, uh, things such as divergent and convergent thinking, so generating lots of ideas are starting to narrow down and see how feasible a solution might be. And so what have we done? So this has led to some really, really awesome and fun activities. So we initiated an experiment uh, replicating some of our early work in the MRI machine, but this time using eye tracking, and we'll tell you a little bit more about it in just a moment. Um, we had a wonderful graduate exchange experience here in the flesh also to, to share some stuff. So yes, I can confirm that these exchanges do happen and they're really wonderful to, to host PhD students from Norway at UC Berkeley and engage in these collaborations. Uh, we also attended a really prestigious conference in our field, the, the Design, Computing, and Cognition Conference that was this past summer in, uh, in Scotland, in Glasgow. So the picture over there is myself with a lot of the lab members from my team at UC Berkeley. And we got to meet up with the Norway team and that was a really nice experience to present some of our work. Um, and then just recently we hosted a joint workshop on training uh, students and researchers here on some of these non-invasive brain imaging uh, technologies, uh, FNIRS and EEG on tasks related to design ideation. So I'd like to uh, welcome Henrika, who's just uh, a PhD student from NTNU, and will share a little bit more about one of the projects that we did um, as a part of this grant. Yeah, so as Kosa said, our collaboration has so far resulted in us having completed an eye tracking experiment. Uh, and this work used the prior work that Kosa mentioned when he used an fMRI to um, look at whether or not providing designers with inspirational stimuli is helpful during conceptual design. So we used the same experimental design, the one that you see here, as Kosa has done previously, but used eye tracking instead. So essentially, we're looking at whether or not inspiration, giving people some sort of an inspired state, if that is helpful, if it works. And the results so far, they corroborate those of the original study. The picture goes over there uh, described that participants produced more ideas over time when they were aided by inspirational stimuli. And this inspirational stimuli was also rated to be more relevant and more useful to solving uh, the problem compared to a neutral stimuli. The second one is that participants allocate more visual attention 
to the inspirational stimuli than they do uh, the, than they do to the neutral stimuli. So essentially they spend more time looking at the inspirational stimuli. And this occurs throughout the entire ideation session. And the third is that in the absence of inspirational stimuli, so in a control condition, participants spend more time um, looking at the problem statement. These results have so far been published and presented at two international conferences. The first one is the International Design Conference, Design 2020. This paper is the one you see over there. And then we also presented at Design Computing and Cognition, where we all met up, which was great. And this paper is currently in, in the press. We have the preprint and everything. And that's the presentation that you see over there. Then I'm going to hand it back to Kosa. OK, great. Yeah, so um, you know, it's been a really wonderful opportunity to grow this collaboration and research as you can imagine uh, it's you know a new area of research we were impacted by the pandemic but it's been nice to continue on now that things are back in person uh, so looking to the immediate future we're working on some new um, modalities of capturing this information uh, and what's really exciting about this is now being able to take some of these experiments where we're using artificial intelligence and, and design methodologies to uh, help stimulate creative uh, processes in engineering design and now being able to, again, study this outside of a lab setting and in more naturalistic environments. Um, so we're working now on a journal paper that's kind of wrapping up some of the most recent stuff um, and also planning to pursue some follow-up funding and, again, more collaborations and exchanges between uh, UC Berkeley and Norway. All right, so here's some of our research product products to date, um, and again, another journal paper underway. Um, and so thank you again um, to, to the Peter Sather Center. It's been a really nice program, and as we've heard this morning, you know, these small injections of the seed funding really can spurn big ideas and collaborations that sustain several years and, and turn into really large projects. So um, thanks again to our really great team. Uh, Philippe uh, Passi, uh, the co-design lab, so that's my lab here at UC Berkeley, and then the troll labs over at NTNU. Um, and if you want to reach out to us, you can, there's some coordinates. I'm leaving to teach now, but then I'll be back for the lunch and look forward to connecting uh, more of the folks then. So thank you very much. Thank you. We will now have a presentation on a project titled Governing Crisis in the European Union, Govern Crisis. The PIs leading this project are Professor Jarla Trondhal, the University of Agder, Norway, will be joining via Zoom, and our own Professor Chris Ansel here at UC Berkeley. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today um, to help celebrate the Peter Sathers Center's 10th anniversary, so congratulations. Um, I don't see Yarla over there. Okay. Uh, the center's support has led to a deep and lasting research collaboration between Yarla Trondahl, who is supposed to be online. He's, I think he's, he's probably on a different uh, connection. Um, he's joining us from Norway, and myself, and uh, to a lively and, and growing research agenda engaging scholars from around the world. Our collaboration started um, just about 10 years ago when Jarla and Morten, Morten Ogard and, um, from University of Agder and Tron Peterson from Berkeley 
uh, with Peter Sather's support, uh, put on a PhD seminar that was entitled Governance in Turbulent Times. And they invited me and a number of Berkeley and Stanford faculty to, to participate. And the basic research question for that seminar was, how do we govern in a world that is increasingly chaotic, polarized, and surprising? Something you all probably appreciate from reading the morning paper. And as you, I'm sure, expect, uh, the seminar didn't really provide a neat or easy answer to that because we would have bottled it otherwise if we could have, uh, if we knew what the answer was. But it did inspire, inspire Yarla and Morton and myself um, to pull together the ideas presented in the seminar in the form of an edited book. So to give those ideas from the seminar some analytical focus, we decided to take the concept of turbulence seriously. The concept originally comes from fluid dynamics, uh, but a few intrepid social scientists have actually been using this idea for a long time. And we built on their work to define turbulence as a situation where events and demands interact in a highly variable, inconsistent, unexpected, and or unpredictable manner. And the reason why this is important is because the dominant theoretical frameworks in our field uh, basically stress the stability of the bureaucratic world punctuated by an occasional crisis. And so what we tried to do was turn that perspective upside down. And we argued that turbulence is increasingly the normal situation for the public sector, um, punctuated by an occasional period of stability. Uh, and we asked, if that's the case, um, how do we begin to rethink our theories of, of governing uh, so that we can think about how turbulence has become the new normal? So the product of those ruminations was our Oxford University Press book, Governance in Turbulent Times, which is on the left, and also an article that Yarla and I wrote for a public administration journal, which basically summarized and extended the, the findings of the, of the book. So um, not to toot our own horn, but, uh, but or maybe just a little bit, but um, uh, really to show that the Peter Sather's support has, has had some impact, I think. Uh, here are the Google cite, Scholar citations for these two projects, uh, which show, I think, uh, oh, I, I kind of skipped a little step in my talk. Anyway, this was the framework in which we uh, kind of organized, the analytical framework that we developed in the article in the book. So I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but it kind of, it, we presented a, a, an analytical framework where, there, where people would think about uh, and analyze uh, how the public sector responds to turbulence. Okay, so, oops. So those are the, the Google citations. And it, this was just meant to kind of show that you can see that there's kind of increasing interest in these ideas that we, we've been developing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> our collaboration has led to a couple of important spin-off projects. And one of them was a Peter Sather supported project entitled Governing Crisis in the European Union, which led to the publication of the Palgrave Handbook of EU Crises, uh, which was edited by Marianne Ritterwald, uh, Yarla, and Akasimi Newsom. And I have a chapter in the, in the volume as well. So this, this project is very timely, um, as you probably know, because the EU has faced a number of very serious crises over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, there's been a financial crisis, an immigration and refugee crisis, the rise of Euroscepticism, and Brexit, and of course COVID, and now Ukraine. And I think what is really stake and what's kind of addressed in this book is um, the survival and future of the EU as a, as a, a functioning international institution. Another spin-off project uh, explores what we call robustness of public institutions and organizations. And um, we came through our research to distinguish between uh, resilience and robustness. <clears throat> um, resilience is a conventional concept in our field, and it has 
different meanings to different people, but it basically refers to the ability to maintain or bounce back to a stable equilibrium or status quo. Robustness, on the other hand, stresses the ability to overcome challenges through continuous innovation and adaptation. So th these two concepts are, are closely related in our mind, but they lead to somewhat different understandings of how the public sector should respond to turbulent conditions. Resilience is about establishing structures and capacity that allow you to withstand or, or bounce back from a shock, where robustness is about having the flexibility and the agility to adapt to surprises. And those, those two things can come into kind of tension as we discuss in some of our work. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, with the support of the um, uh, Regional uh, Research Council of Norway, we've launched, launched another project, or we've launched a project building on this idea, uh, which is entitled Collaborative Strategies for Robust Governance in Turbulent Times, or TurbGov for short, which brings in two new partners, Nord University in, in Norway and also Roskilde University in Denmark. And the project has already produced a special issue on the topic of robust governance in the Journal of Public Administration, with articles by both Yarla and myself shown here. But also, and I think this is really important uh, to stress, but also contributions from scholars from Canada, China, Denmark, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Singapore, and the UK. And so what I wanted to show with this talk was, was basically that with the early and continuing support of the Pater Sather program, our Agder Berkeley collaboration, that was the kernel, uh, has gradually ripened into an international research agenda that we're really excited about. And I'm, I'm happy to say that the Pater Sather program has recently given us a new, uh, um, uh, some additional support, which will help us, Yarla and I, take this project to the next, next level. So um, thank you, Pater Sather and um, happy anniversary. Thank you so much. Please join me again in another round of applause for all those wonderful research presentations. We will now have a short break before we resume uh, research presentations at 10.40 a.m. Thank you.
please take your seats. So we'd like to resume. Welcome back. We will now continue with our research showcase highlighting 10 years of academic collaboration at the Pater Sather Center. We now have a project titled Legitimacy and Fallibility in Child Welfare Services, a cross-country study of decision-making. The principal investigators are Professor Maritz Givenes at the University of Bergen in Norway and our own Professor Jill Barrick from UC Berkeley. Thank you. Good morning and thank you. I was just saying to Akasemi that this has been a fun morning just to see this whirlwind tour of different countries, different projects, and I've learned so much. So thank you for sponsoring this wonderful morning this morning. I want to um, acknowledge my collaborator, Marit Shivanis, who at the Department of uh, University of Bergen, who is on Zoom, though we may not be able to see her at the moment. So welcome to my partner as well. Um, we have benefited uh, quite substantially from funding from the Peter Sather Center, and we thank you for that, and we feel quite confident that the several projects that we've conducted over the last couple of years have really uh, met the goals of Peter Sather, which are, of course, to encourage our cross-national collaboration, to inspire new research development, and to support uh, new funding. And so I'm going to tell you just a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing that uh, cuts across all of these issues. I'm sorry I don't have more time to give you a deeper picture, but again, this is just a general quick overview. So the context of our work is, the, is uh, the social safety net or the international welfare state. And so the focus of much of our work is on Norway and the United States, although as I'll say in a moment, that is now expanding quite dramatically. Uh, many of you are probably familiar that the welfare state in Norway is substantially different from the welfare state in the United States. In general, in the welfare state literature, we think of Norway as being a social democratic welfare state. It has a relatively strong social support network, a relatively thick uh, uh, system of services for vulnerable individuals and or families. In a comparative perspective, the United States is not that. It is considered a liberal welfare state in the welfare state literature, and it has a relatively thin social support uh, system in terms of cash assistance, social security provisions, unemployment, et cetera. So this is the nature of our work, but our work is focused specifically on the child welfare state or the child protection state, which is nested within each of these larger umbrellas of welfare states. So when you think of child protection, just to get everyone oriented, you're thinking of those programs and policies designed to protect children when they're being harmed, usually at the hands of their parent or some other caregiver. And so that is the nature of our interest. And our interest is in these uh, how child protection policies and programs, which are nested in these very different states, are embodied are embodied either by the actors who are the, providing this protective function. So we've done collaborate collaborative projects looking at Norway and the United States in terms of the provision of foster care services. We look at these differences, looking at uh, how policies and programs are embodied embodied by the actors who carry out the mandate of government, so that might be social workers or judges and how they differ in the way they respond to child protection. And then most recently, we've shifted our focus to looking at the public and public attitudes about child protection, both in Norway and the United States, to determine whether or not the public's understanding of these fundamental principles underlying a child protection system mirror or map onto what those child protection systems actually look like in those countries. So uh, 
oops, I moved ahead. Sorry about that. So the first study that I'll just tell you about very briefly is looking at this fundamental question of safety versus privacy. So when you think about child protection, it's many, many things. But as it, at, its, at its essence, when you're thinking about the government becoming involved in the private lives of families, that's a very contested space because government is intruding upon family privacy or family integrity. But that family privacy, it has to be balanced with children's safety. And so do we intervene when children are unsafe, but yet interrupt family privacy? Or do we not intervene because we want to preserve family privacy regardless of children's safety? That's at the heart of child protection in every country across the globe. But how does the public sort of think through this puzzle of setting your threshold, how much safety can we tolerate or lack of safety can we tolerate before privacy needs to be interrupted in the family. So this study was a random sample of adults, both in Norway and in, uh, and in California. We were pre presented our respondents with a vignette to characterize a very typical child protection uh, uh, family. We then randomly distributed our respondents to three, three, three versions of that vignette, a very low risk version, a medium risk, or a high risk version where the child was clearly very unsafe to examine whether people generally fall in their distribution of, of their preferences towards a safety orientation or a uh, family privacy orientation. In general, we found that as risk rises, people are more inclined to see privacy being appropriately um, um, subverted and having parent parental uh, activity restricted in some way. We also looked to see whether these views differed by country. And in fact, we did find that Norwegians were much more likely to support government involvement in the family or this abrogation of privacy. And US residents or California residents were much less likely to, to be inclined to restrict any parenting uh, any, any privacy on the family. In a second study that we did, we examined this question of children's rights and parents' rights. So for those of you who may not be familiar, children's rights is a very fundamental concept in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Norway has incorporated the UN Convention into their constitution. So children do have rights in the constitutional frame of Norway. That's not exactly the case in the United States. And if you've been following the news, you'll see that many states are playing with this notion of parents' rights in the United States. And parents' rights are, on the, uh, are in the ascendancy in several states. So again, we wanted to look at this question of whether or not children's right, uh, this view about children's rights or parents' rights differed based upon the risk of the child and if there were differences across countries. Yes, indeed, we found that Norwegians were much more orientated toward to children's rights uh, uh, orientation than were folks in the US. The US is much more likely to be oriented towards parents' rights, but that these differences did not vary based upon the risk of the child. Uh, for time, I'm going to move out past that. Uh, and we are now in the midst of trying to replicate this study since children are themselves the subject of all child protection proceedings in all countries. We are replicating this study asking youth, ages 15, 16, or 17, their views about children's rights or parents' rights and their views about privacy versus safety. And so that project is currently underway. This work has inspired us to think globally, much further beyond Norway and, and the United States, to think about what does child protection look like across the globe and how does it differ? So we pulled together uh, a, with our colleague Neil Gilbert some work that examined 50 countries across the globe to examine what their child protection systems look like based upon uh, a series of questions. We did a content analysis of these qualitative data and we've come up with what we believe is a five-part typology of different child protection systems. Norway is, is representative of one of those typologies. The US is representative of a second. But we've identified what we believe are three more. And this book is coming out in December. That Those ideas that are based upon qualitative data need to be empirically tested, however. So we're just thrilled about the fact that we are now embarking, starting in January, in a new project called CPS World that will test this typology using a variety of empirical methods. And this new project is funded from the National, Norwegian National Research Council. We're just thrilled to have that opportunity to begin to test this typology. Why are typologies important? Because they give policymakers 
aspirational tools to think about the levers that they can implement in particular dimensions of policy making to move their country from one typological state to another. And we believe that there are many countries that you can, you can tell from their uh, policy prescriptions that they have these aspirational um, notions, but they haven't yet created the framework to, uh, to reach their aspirations. So briefly, in closing, I'll just list some of the publications that we have um, produced as a result of our collaboration. Several of these include doctoral students, and we are, again, so grateful to the Pater Souther Center for all of these opportunities to improve our understanding of child protection across the country. Thank you so much. We will now have a presentation on Zoom where the research project is titled Towards a Better Understanding of Interhemispheric Asymmetries in the Global Aurora. The PIs will be Professor Nikolai Osko from the, from the University of Bergen in Norway, uh, Professor Jona Peter Reistad from the University of Bergen in Norway, and uh, the PIs Professor Harold Frey and Stuart Bale from UC Berkeley, unfortunately, will not be joining us. Thank you. OK, my name is Nikolai Ostgard, and I will give the first three, four slides. <clears throat> and Yuna, which stayed five months at uh, Berkeley, will give the rest of the pre presentation. You already said the title of the presentation, so we go to the next slide. <clears throat> Can you do that, uh, Jona? Thank you. So this is about um, interhemispheric asymmetry, meaning that the aurora in the northern and southern hemisphere look different. So to the left, you will see a study that I did when I was actually at Berkeley, uh, where we see the aurora to the left is in the northern and to the right is in the southern hemisphere. And this is plotted now in uh, magnetic coordinates. And we can see that the two shapes are displaced to each other. And we also see uh, a magnetic field of the solar wind, uh, which we think has a big influence of this asymmetry. And we see in the middle panel, which is the transverse or the east-west component of the solar winds magnetic field is, uh, is the one that stands out. And we thought at the time that was very important to explain this. Later, as you see for in the right, <coughs> we had um, a study that was featured in Nature where we saw completely different uh, aurora in the two hemispheres. You see the northern up and, and the southern down, and you see that those two dots are not connected magnetically. So this was completely different. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. So this to put up three different hypotheses. I'm not gonna explain all these figures to the left, but the upper one, uh, is based on looking at the radial component of the magnetic field from, from the sun. That could have an influence of creating those asymmetries that we observed. In the middle, we had the east-west, which I already mentioned, and we thought that could penetrate through, through something called tail reconnection and set up these, these uh, asymmetries. And last, we had conductivity effects, which is basically that as uh, because the sun, the, the earth, uh, the rotational axis of the earth has a tilt uh, to the sun, as we know as summer and winter. So one hemisphere is always more exposed to solar radiation than the other. And that gives different conductivity in the upper ionosphere. We <coughs> studied all these three and we ended up seeing that it was actually the east-west component that was the most important uh, component. Next slide, please, Yuna. But the way we thought how it 
worked was completely wrong. We thought that this was kind of penetrating the magnetosphere, which is where the Earth's magnetic field is dominating, and maybe came in from the tail through something called tail reconnection. That was wrong. What was indeed the, the reason for this is what we tried to show you on the right. Uh, this is seen uh, uh, pre magnetic pressure onto the Earth magnetosphere seen from the sun. And when there's no east-west component, which is the IMF B Y equals zero, then you can see the pressure is pretty much symmetric in the north and south. When we introduce uh, east-west component, now we see the pressure is asymmetric north-south. And, and the pressure is, is, the, is the red one that you see here. And when we now look at this from the tail or from looking towards the sun and we see the earth there, then we see the magnetic fields are bent, which will give different foot points of those magnetic field. And since the aurora are created by particles that come down these magnetic field lines, that could explain the asymmetry. And this is where Yuna's projects fits in. And now Yuna will take over. Thank you, Nikolai. Uh, my name is uh, Yuna Reisva, and I am a researcher at the University of Bergen, the same place as Nikolai. Um, and uh, I was the PhD student that was doing this uh, exchange to, to Berkeley in 2015. So back then, uh, Nikolai was was my PhD uh, supervisor, and I was uh, very happy. So I have to thank the, the Peter Cedar Foundation for giving me the the opportunity to to go to to Berkeley for for five months to do this uh, research exchange. So Nikolai has introduced uh, the topic of of this uh, project. So 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 the Peter Cedar Center um, project was was a part of a much bigger effort um, uh, on work on on interhemispheric asymmetries of, of the aurora between the two hemispheres. Uh, which was work uh, initiated by, by, by Nikolai while he was uh, actually working in, in Berkeley er earlier. Uh, so um, I was staying in Berkeley in, in, uh, in half a year working with Hall, uh, Dr. Harl Fry at, at the Space Science uh, Laboratory. And um, he was a key person uh, in this uh, project because of his expertise in, in developing the, one of the key instruments that we used, uh, so a, a global uh, aurora imager uh, on a space um, born um, uh, instrument looking down at, at the aurora. So, so that was uh, developed, this uh, instrument in, in Berkeley and working together with uh, Harold Fry and his group in, uh, in, in, in SSL in, in Berkeley was, uh, was, was a very, very uh, a fruitful uh, uh, time of, of my PhD in, uh, uh, project. And as Nikolai mentioned, um, it was, it, we, we had started to, to, to develop a new framework of how to explain these asymmetries in, in, in geospace and how, how these asymmetries uh, was established. But during, um, during this um, Peter Sitter uh, project, uh, I would say that was sort of um, around the time when, when we sort of uh, stumbled across um, how, how, these, uh, how these asymmetries also may, may be uh, reduced. So it was sort of a controversial uh, um, study uh, uh, or, or result what we found out um, around that time, namely that that the tail reconnection process, so, so what causes the most intense and, 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 uh, and, and, and strong auroras on, on the night side, actually uh, leads to, to, to reduce asymmetries in the aurora between the two hemispheres. So earlier that was sort of, um, the consensus was that that was the process that establishes the, the, the asymmetries. And, and um, the work towards that result was, um, was uh, sort of, uh, the, the work during the Peter Setter project was, was an integral part of that, that uh, process. And, and we also, um, yeah, the, the collaboration with, with Harold Fry and at SSL Berkeley has, has also continued up to, to date. So um, what, I, what I told about the, the role of tail reconnection, so the internal processes, not only the, the external pro forcing from, from the solar wind on the system, but also the effect of the internal processes acting to, to remove these asymmetries that was uh, picked up a few years later 
when uh, we published two studies in, in 2018 uh, in a series of papers uh, describing these effects. And um, there was a American Geophysical Union a press release um, related to this uh, publication. And the editor uh, in chief of, of the Journal of uh, Geophysical Research, he said uh, that therefore these results is kind of big deal. So it's uh, highlighting the, the, the importance of this internal process being sort of opposite of what was uh, expected uh, earlier. So we got, uh, we got actually quite decent uh, press uh, coverage from due to this press, uh, press release. Uh, a lot of different uh, media uh, picked it up, the story. And we also uh, got um, made, made an animation of, of, the, of the process of how we, uh, how we describe that the, the, the near Earth space is becoming asymmetric due to the forcing in the solar wind and the internal processes inside the magnetosphere is acting to, to reduce that asymmetry. So that's sort of our, our key findings boiled down into, into one uh, animation like this. So um, I, will, I will stop here and um, pass the word uh, further. Thank you so Thank you. much for your presentation. We will now have another presentation on Zoom titled Addressing Nuclear Data Needs in the Thorium Fuel Cycle. The principal investigators for this project are Professor Suniva Siem from the University of Oslo in Norway and Professor Yasmina Vucic at UC Berkeley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, my collaborator, uh, Suniva Siem, is also present. Um, she is a professor in the Department of Physics, uh, basically nuclear um, and energy physics, and I'm professor in nuclear engineering department. Um, I will just uh, say summary up front if we get uh, cut off at the end. So we are extremely thankful for three grants that we received over a period of 10 years. So we are also celebrating 10 years of collaboration. Uh, and uh, we were able to expand it to get additional grants to support a list of uh, graduate students to organize uh, many workshops and summer school that I uh, will mention uh, at least few of those and to focus on the strength of uh, University of Oslo Department of Physics in their experimental and theoretical determination of statistical properties of nucleus, uh, nuclear structures on um, uh, the support uh, that we have here at UC Berkeley, both experimental uh, such as 88 synchrotron at LBL, as well as uh, uh, strength of the department in nuclear uh, data, particularly cross sections that are necessary for uh, nuclear power development. And knowing that Norway is very rich in thorium, we also focused on studying uh, thorium cycle for nuclear reactors in addition to existing uranium cycle. So the first grant we obtained in 2013 and uh, it was a uh, nice title, What Color Are Atomic Nuclei? Uh, again, we had several additional researchers, including Dr. Lee Bernstein from uh, Nuclear Engineering Department and LBL, as well as Dr. Bethany Goldblum. The first grad students that were supported is Tibola Plus, who actually uh, graduated um, and uh, he's now postdoc up at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, the uh, first grant um, it was used to organize uh, the first workshop that we have in November 2014. We had 40 students, postdocs, as well as faculty and staff scientists from uh, Lawrence Berkeley and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. We had visits from Professor Sunia Sien and her team. Uh, later, we had our team going to Oslo and it continued over 
uh, 10 years. So this is uh, the first workshop that we had here in Berkeley and topics are uh, related to both uh, nuclear structure, cross sections, nuclear data, reactor technologies uh, uh, and experimental facilities that both universities could present. Uh, so this is the list of collaborators uh, for this particular workshop. The second grant was uh, in 2014, and it was specifically addressing nuclear data needs for thorium cycle. Again, we had the same team, but we had a new uh, grad student, Eric Matthews, and uh, Adriana Urechibot from UC Berkeley. Uh, just very simple um, and very short uh, a description of what they did. Adriana had uh, her master thesis completed in 2017 on spin within beta Oslo method. And we use this beta Oslo method for many of our uh, uh, PhD thesis and master thesis as well as at Oslo and here at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, she graduated, um, Eric Matthews as well from UC Berkeley, the thesis on advancement in nuclear data of fission yields, uh, which are extremely important for advanced reactor designs, both uranium and thorium cycle. He also, uh, through collaboration on another project that uh, uh, Suniva uh, probably will talk about, in part, uh, went to Berkeley and collaborated on fission properties. Uh, so in addition to the workshop on nuclear structure that we held in December of 2014, we also signed a memorandum of understanding at that time between University of Berkeley and the University of Oslo. Uh, at this uh, workshop, we had 50 graduate students, postdoc and faculty and staff from our universities, as well as uh, national laboratories. And uh, we discuss about nuclear structures, statistical properties of nucleus, as well as future experiments that we were able to perform over the last several years and neutronics and nuclear data that we need for, for reactors. You cannot probably uh, read this, but these are the topics that we covered. This is the list of participants that I already mentioned, over 50. This is the list of our students. And uh, what we have um, uh, is memorandum of understanding that was signed at that time uh, for our students and faculty to be able to utilize uh, facilities at uh, University of Oslo, as well as facilities here at UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, the third grant was in July of 2020. Uh, again, it was related to nuclear data deficiency, put particular nuclides, um, and it was supposed to be part of the PhD thesis of Adriana Urece. She was supposed to go to Argonne National Laboratory to do experimental measurements or fantastic uh, experimental facility Caribou. But due to COVID restrictions, she was not able to do that. And she completed thesis in 21 without actually doing that experiment. But we have a new PhD students that will be going to are going to perform those experiments. Eric Matthews also completed his thesis and he is postdoc now at Lawrence uh, Berkeley National Laboratory. Now I will switch to Suniva to talk about Oslo workshop on level density and gamma strength. <laughs> okay, well, I first also have to say thank you so much for these grants we have uh, gotten from the Pedder Center. Uh, these have been very valuable for us. And one of the things um, we have been able to do is we, we have an international workshop every two years in Oslo on level densities and gamma strength function. And this funding has also helped bring people from Berkeley to join this um, workshop. And uh, we have also expanded by getting uh, a grant from Norwegian Research Council called INTPART together, which uh, also has made it possible to bring even more students uh, both to Berkeley for, uh, and back again, uh, or back also to Norway. 
so uh, you can yes, so uh, uh, this is for show what we actually do if you want yes <laughs> so these are the statistical properties of a nucleus which are governing the decay of a nucleus level densities and strength functions and um for this we and Oslo are experts. We have uh, developed a method, which is now <laughs> called the Oslo method, actually, to to be able to uh, uh, to measure these two simultaneously. So, and we've had students like you, uh, Tibor uh, Plus, He actually some of his data for his thesis was taken in Oslo, and uh, also the other way around. We've had master's student and PhD students who have been in Berkeley and gotten data. Uh, in Berkeley for their thesis is in Oslo. So we've had a, um, a lot of uh, collaboration and this money is very valuable to, for, stu like for student exchange. And yes, and this one is the last, uh, this was the workshop this year. So then there was uh, also several students from uh, Berkeley which were there and presented their uh, PhD work. Okay, thank you, uh, Soniva. So this is the last grant that uh, uh, we obtained in 2020. It was affected, as I mentioned, uh, uh, with COVID, um, uh, but this year we got extensions. So we, this year, in addition to Oslo workshop, we organized Nuclear Data Summer School for the first time. Um, again, uh, it was uh, uh, with support of Lee Bernstein and Bethany Goldblum. We have a uh, uh, new student, Isabel Hernandez. Uh, and just, uh, uh, we had four students from Oslo that came here together with Berkeley students. This is a picture that we're able to do actually experiments. A paper will be published as well. And these are some of the topics the students uh, were able to listen to in isotope production, nuclear data, and different measurements. Eric Matthews, who in the meantime graduated, was the co-organizer of this school. This, is, uh, this was two weeks and uh, students were extremely, extremely happy about it. So um, I think we are at the end of our presentation. So I would like just to point out again that we are extremely uh, grateful. We will continue our collaboration. We published uh, uh, many joint publications and I will list just few at the end of this presentation. Um, and, um, just to point out that here from Berkeley, we had three PhD students that graduated and now are postdocs in national laboratories. So thank you very much once again. Thank you so much. We'll now keep moving to our next research presentation titled Electrophysiology of Frontal Parietal Control of Spatial Attention. And the PIs we have presenting this research, Professor Tora Endestad, uh, Professor Anne Kristin Solbach, Professor Alexander Jensenius from the University of Oslo, and also Professor Robert Knight from UC Berkeley. Thank you. Thank you. So my colleagues should be coming on. Somewhere. Are they there? Perfect. Well, um, so we've had a long term collaboration with the University of Oslo starting actually in 2004, and then in the Petter Sather Center, NICE provided support in 2013 that allowed us to expand our research and led to other grants and actually a large center in Norway. Ritmo on rhythm, music, and dance. Uh, what I'm going to do is turn this over to my long-term colleagues, Tor and Anna Christine, who will present an overview of what we've been able to accomplish. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, congratulations on the 10-year anniversary from a Ritmo Center in Oslo. Thank you so much for the kind invitation to present our long-standing research on educational collaboration with Professor Knight, a collaboration that clearly benefited from the funding we have received from the Setter Center. 
Our overarching research aim is to understand the neural basis of cognitive control functions in the human brain, which are critical for goal-directed and flexible behavior. We have a special emphasis on the role of the prefrontal cortex and its subregions. Some broad research questions we are jointly investigating are, what neural processes support the interplay between prefrontal cortex and other brain regions that are engaged doing tasks requiring attention and working memory? Anticipating future events is a fundamental feature of the brain. And we ask if there is a hierarchical neural organization of predictive processing. And at the highest level, what prefrontal areas are crucially involved? In a related line of research, we aim to answer questions about the roles of timing and rhythm in directing our attention and expectations. In our efforts to reveal the neurobiological mechanism supporting cognitive control, we use neuropsychological, neuroanatomical, electrophysiological, and functional, functional MRI techniques in healthy individuals and in patients with damage to the frontal lobes. As the only team in Scandinavia, we also record intracranial EEG directly from the cortical surface or from deep brain structures in neurosurgical patients. This allows us to examine in detail the electrophysiological activity taking place during cognitive tasks. The intracranial EEG program is a direct consequence of our collaboration with Professor Knight, who is a pioneer in the field. Hi, I'm Tore Ambestad. Uh, as you can see over the years, uh, since before we got our grant from Peter Seater in, um, in 2014, uh, uh, we have developed quite an extensive collaboration with Berkeley. And uh, it has led to a lot of traveling activity between Oslo and Berkeley. Uh, we have uh, had uh, master students going from Oslo, master students coming from Berkeley, PhD students going back and forth for research days or visits to collect data at both sides. And we have uh, uh, had a lot of bilateral workshops over the years. Uh, and some of them are quite exotic places as you probably can see. Uh, and we not only have uh, 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 helped each other with uh, the competency needed to do research, but we also taught each other skills that is needed to have some fun. Uh, in Norway, uh, uh, students from Berkeley has learned to do uh, uh, Arctic fishery and archery. Uh, and uh, we have had such a, a fantastic uh, uh, hospitality. We have been met with such a fantastic hospitality when we've been in Berkeley visiting Bob Knight's lab. Now, we have together written 30 research proposals. And of course, you don't get everything, but uh, apart from the Peter Setugant, we got 11 uh, joint projects funded from uh, several uh, financing bodies. And the last one uh, uh, is a center of excellence uh, uh, located in, uh, at the University of Oslo, where Bob Knight is in the uh, advisory board. Uh, and where we have received uh, uh, an INSPART grant, uh, national travel grant, uh, for activities between Berkeley and Oslo from the Research Council. Now, there has also been quite a bit of output over these years. Uh, several papers have been written up, and you here see a collection of some of them. And uh, we were actually not able to count the conference contributions. We had, there are too many of them to keep count of them. Uh, so uh, the activity has been high, and uh, the direct involvement of people from Berkeley and Norway has led to a, a tremendous amount of uh, scientific output. So I don't know, Bob, here is actually a picture from our last visit to Berkeley with uh, Ritmo and Intpart. Uh, and those of you who are in Berkeley might perhaps know where we were having dinner that day. Uh, I don't know, Bob, if you would like to say something uh, concluding this. Uh, I'll just say a couple things. I think the collaboration has been really fantastic on, in every dimension, from the training aspect to the scientific productivity. I will mention that for those of you who ever want to go to northern uh, Norway, where there are polar bears, that TOR is a certified 
polar bear hunter, so he can go with you and you can go camping. I've suggested doing that. My wife is not crazy about the idea, but I think it could be, it could be uh, quite nice. I think um, one other thing that I mentioned to the ambassador is I think I've been personally a big contributor to the economy of um, Norway because having been there many times, I've had to buy multiple Andros Dali sweaters for my wife, my daughter, and my two granddaughters. And as you know, they're not cheap. Uh, but uh, fun aside, it's just been a wonderful collaboration, and we really look forward to the next 10 years of the Pether Center. It's really been incredibly helpful to our science. Thank you so much. We will now have an in-person presentation titled Teachers Skillful Coping with Disruptive Behavior in Norwegian and American Classrooms, Student Involvement. The PIs for this project have been Professor Liv Duesund from University of Oslo, Professor Magnar Odegaard from University of Oslo, and Professor Elliot Turiel from UC Berkeley. Thank you. Yes, my name is Magnar Ødegaard, eller Magnar Ødegaard. I'm here to present Teacher Skillful Coping with Disruptive Behavior in Norwegian and American Classrooms. I will emphasize student involvement, and I am part of this project together with Professors Liv Duesund and Elliot Turiel. The project builds on a comparative study of disruptive behavior between schools in Norway and the United States. That project involved a large number of bachelor students and master students from the University of Oslo to the University of California, Berkeley. I was part of the master's students. For the students pursuing further academic careers, there were three postdocs, no, three PhDs and two postdocs, five in total. We, some of us went even further and became associate professors at various Norwegian institutions. We define disruptive behavior as any behavior that is perceived as sufficiently off task in the classroom as to distract teachers and or class peers from learning activities. Our research indicates that the majority of students get distracted by disruptive behavior, and often on a daily basis. Teachers struggle to cope with this behavior and feel professionally de-skilled as a consequence of it. And disruptive behavior impairs students' learning and social development. We aim to acquire knowledge about how teachers approach students in classrooms okay, uh, when disruptive behavior occurs. This includes the actions that they take and the strategies that they apply. We examine which skills teachers apply when coping with disruptive behavior. Amongst those are the skills needed and applied and how we can train on these skills. We ask how teachers reflect on their skills in coping with disruptive behavior, their actions, their development, etc. We also ask how the model of skill acquisition by Hubert and Stuart Dreyfus could relate to teachers coping with disruptive behavior. This model illustrates um, going from novice to expert through five stages, uh, going from rule-dependent action to intuitive action. Our methodology is conceptual, and we have interviews and surveys on Norwegian and American teachers. The students involved, master students, are collecting data and writing their thesis within the project. These are our core concepts. We study the human way of being. We apply being in the world, skillful coping, everydayness, and moods. All of these terms are uh, illustrating our interrelatedness with the world. When we recruited students to our project, we held six lectures for the students at the course Psychosocial Difficulties at the University of Oslo. The interested students 
uh, were interviewed. We held interviews with each and every one, and we discussed what we expect from them, uh, what they can expect from us, and how they envision their contribution to the project. And after that, we held four writing seminars for the students. Here you can see a list of the students involved from uh, every year. We held four writing seminars. They authored their project descriptions. We then held a full day workshop where they discussed, gave each other feedback, etc. And as you can see from the bottom part of the table, we have had seven students here at Berkeley, Norwegian students, and 15 in Oslo, and so far the combined number is 22. The thematic areas covered by the students are, uh, it's a wide range. We have skill acquisition, being in the world, coping, technology as a disruptive factor, etc. The point is that the students are covering disruptive behavior and seeing it through the lens of fields like education, philosophy, psychology, and sociology. So the future work with this project, we, are, we have developed a website and we have developed a podcast where our students are involved. And now they're reaching out themselves, new students, asking to participate in the project. And I must say, I'm, we're, we're, pretty, we're proud of that. So the impact of our research, we hope to contribute to insight into disruptive behavior. We hope to contribute to teaching and supervision in academia. And we hope to contribute on international collaboration and recruitment to academia. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. We will now have a final research presentation titled The New Arctic and the Digital Ocean, a comparative study of the US and Norwegian Arctics. The principal investigators for this project are Professor Barrett Christofferson from the University of Tromsø in Norway and Professor Michael Watts from UC Berkeley. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, like previous speakers, I'd like to acknowledge the generosity of Pather Sather, uh, who in this case has permitted us to build research networks with two universities actually in Norway, uh, NTNU in Trondheim and the University of Tromsø. Uh, with my colleague here, uh, who is broadcasting to you, uh, not from Tromsø, but from the rather wonderful Lofoten Archipelago, which if you've never had an opportunity to visit, I can not only recommend it, it's utterly stunning, but she's also broadcasting from the local Lofoten Seaweed Company, whose products I can unreservedly endorse. <laughs> okay, um, our project is, uh, entails actually two projects that are related. I'm just going to give a framing of the broad project and a little about the first, and then I'm going to hand over very quickly to uh, Barrett to talk about the second, which is actually work in train. There have been a cluster of faculty involved, including Barrett and myself, uh, Dr. Uh, Vidar Hespa in Geosciences at NTNU, uh, along with an anthropologist, Dr. Arthur Mason at the same institution. And a part of the, part of the core faculty uh, was a doctoral student who's here, who currently has just taken an appointment at University of Chicago, uh, Alexander Arroyo. So, um, two projects. I'm going to talk largely about the first. The second is in train, and uh, Barrett will talk uh, a little about that. Uh, substantively, what's the project? The project is simply this. 2017, NOAA, the National Oceanic um, and Atmospheric Administration, uh, issued a report, of course triggered by the IPCC, Global Climate Change, uh, pertaining to the new Arctic. Uh, that signaled a massive and irreversible phase of change in the material composition of the Arctic Ocean and its terrestrial peripheries, rather than this inhospitable zone. Now, the new Arctic was seen through the lens of runaway melt, thaw, liquefaction, off-gassing, and so on and so forth. Quantitative and architectonic changes in the entire uh, Arctic itself. Our task, then, was to look at uh, 
the techniques, the techno-scientific production associated with determining the contours of this new Arctic. But of course, that so-called environmental intelligence, new sorts of technologies, the digital ocean, as it was called, um, also opened up for us a series of related questions. This is a multidisciplinary project involving geographers, anthropologists, political scientists, geosciences. Expressed through, for example, the fact that this new techno-scientific data, the new Arctic, was associated with two other sorts of things. The opening up of a sort of resource frontier, and secondly, new forms of speculative investment. And that had, it turns out, a Bay Area connection. Why? Because some of those techno-scientific productions were in fact a product of Silicon Valley. Uh, some of you are perhaps familiar with Sail Drone in Oakland here, real-time monitoring uh, of oceanic dynamics. Uh, and venture capital. Uh, LLC Guggenheim in 2017, it's New York-based fund, uh, but with venture capital from the Bay Area, uh, released the first Arctic investment portfolio. So that's uh, the nature of the beast, as it were. Um, I'm just going to flag three themes. I can't talk about them in detail that this first phase uh, entailed. One was what we called Arctic speculation. I've just uh, um, referred to the likes of investment and new sorts of um, economic investment in this opening, this new frontier. Secondly, what we called Arctic Futures and Environmental Intelligence, the new techno-scientific types of insights. Uh, Boeing has, for instance, a, a subsidiary called Liquid Robotics, uh, which talks about the ocean of things in the same way that we refer to the um, internet of things. DARPA. Uh, for example, uh, talks of the digital ocean and so on. These, th we were looking then at these types of scientific entities. And thirdly, what we called the new Arctic mineral and energy complex. Of course, oil and gas has been exploding in the Arctic forever. Right? But now, because of these changes induced by global climate change, the frontier of oil and gas is moving increasingly, for example, into the Barents, the Barents Sea. Briefly, what came out of all of this before I hand over to Berit, uh, a workshop here uh, involving US, Canadian, Norwegian scholars, a Trondheim workshop where we had uh, interactions with Equinor, Statoil, National Oil Company, including some field work in Lofoten, uh, where some of these technologies and some of these resource frontier questions are being explored. We have a book which emerged, uh, edited by Arthur Mason, called Arctic Abstraction. We raised an NSF grant for networking. And we had, interestingly, some collaborations with TAB21, which is an arts group, actually, who were very interested in some of the visualization of the ocean associated with these new technologies. That's the first phase. Let me then pass over to Barrett from Lofoten, University of Tromsø, who's going to talk about the second part. Uh, of the project, which incidentally is currently in train. We were delayed uh, last by COVID, but that project is currently in train. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be able to uh, be part of this fantastic project and also for the um, very um, fantastic funding from Peter Sater. I think it's very important listening to all the projects today. It's just shows how the depth and importance of it. So um, Michael talked a bit about uh, the Ocean Archive project we worked with and how we engaged with these um, um, stakeholders, Sail Drone here, who do, do this autonomous mapping, and Equinor, who does all kinds of mapping underneath the seabed. And uh, this was really important also for the various PhD students we also brought along to this um, workshops. And um, I think, um, as Michael mentioned, the mineral um, complex is really what is um, gaining importance right now. We have this green transition and we need lots of minerals. And one of the big focus areas of the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate is to encourage and um, start these new seabed mining industries in Norway. So they're setting up 
a framework based on the same way as uh, they have done with oil and gas, so using the same kind of framework. And um, one of the questions we ask in this next, next project is then what happens to the political life of the ice edge. So anyone who's familiar with Norwegian politics the last five, ten years know that the ice edge, um, where we see on the right here with the ice frequency mapped by the Norwegian Polar Institute, has been the been an actor in itself and in sort of the delimination of uh, where oil can be drilled. So the further up uh, the ice goes, the further up the oil companies can drill. Uh, so um, since we are especially really interested in kind of these new uh, mapping practices and techniques in the digital ocean, and uh, then what happens next is that we we do look at um, the various practices involved in also um, how mining is going to go about. And here we see on the left um, oil mapping, kind of an oil old tradition <laughs> uh, with seismic. We see it going back already to the early 1970s, they were mapping around the Svalbard Peninsula Ar uh, archipelago group, I mean. And uh, we know that Antenu, Equinod, all kinds of actors are now no, um, getting more involved in what's happening at the ocean floor as we experienced when we went to Equinod in uh, 2019. And as part of this, um, this sort of conceptual changes, I mean, the big changes with uh, understanding how the new Arctic is opening up a new world of anthropogenic accumulation, uh, we also need new conceptual frameworks to work around. So one of the lenses uh, that we work towards is led by Alexander, who is working on, um, on a framework called elemental geopolitics. So we are particularly interested then in the role of speculation and the role of uncertainty when it comes to how geographic uh, knowledge production is accumulated, as we are all geographers, the core three researchers among us. Uh, this is an important insight. But we also want to work with the Nansen Legacy Project. And um, the Nansen Legacy Project is uh, 75 uh, million uh, US dollars funded project that is mapping the Barents North. So pretty much on the left here, we see an old map of the ice touch. This is where um, a big uh, group of researchers from different institutions led by University of Tromsø is mapping the Barents North. So this mapping is a very important prerequisite for how also uh, economic activities will be going on for the next decades. And uh, as we have invited also the Nansen legacy or, um, researchers into the proposal for us to have a way to engage with and discuss our analytical approaches towards their knowledge and their analytical approaches in a time of the Anthropocene. This is the second main activity we will do in 2023 in the spring. So with that, I will uh, pass it over to Berkeley again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. We will now conclude uh, the section of the program featuring uh, our research showcase. I now have the honor of introducing Professor Asa Gornitska for closing remarks. Professor Asa Gornitska is pro-rector of the University of Oslo and member of the Norwegian Advisory Board to the Pather Satter Center here at UC Berkeley. She's a professor of political science at University of Oslo with research interests in public administration, EU governance, and organization theory. She's also past board member at ScanCore, the Scandinavian Consortium for Research at Stanford and Harvard Universities. Please give Prorector Gornitska a round of applause. Thank you.
Dear colleagues, dear friends, dear uh, and friends of the university, dear ambassador, from the, uh, my office window I have the perfect view over the Blinland campus, uh, University of Oslo's main campus. And every morning I can watch students coming from trams, from buses, from the tube, on bikes, in any kind of weather, they're pouring over the university square on their way to lecture halls, study groups, maybe late for class. Their motivations are true, uh, possibly mixed. They are in search for love, recognition, friendship, what have you. But they're also in search of knowledge and skills. Some, sometimes I think, little do they know what they're in for, what kind of mark that the universities and higher education put on young minds, on students and our graduates. We know how much it matters. There are actually few social phenomena that are not linked to higher education in some way. Whether you have higher education and what kind of higher education background you have. So it affects life expectancy careers, of course, choice of partners, choice of political, polit political inclination, but not the least, the way you think. Higher education will leave a mark. So the strongest societal impact that we as research intensive universities have is through our graduates. The quality of research impacts on the quality of our study programs and through our, and through our candidates. And they, in turn, have an effect on the quality of key institutions in society. They have a, the, on the quality of healthcare, legal system, courts, and the government agencies, schools. It is actually the difference between competent and incompetent bureaucracy. Competent and incompetent central banks, competent or incompetent uh, legal uh, courts of law. So it's, uh, it's uh, also the provision of, uh, of the quality of public services and the quality of our private industries. Higher education and research and Peter Theatre Centre with it, they are essentially about meeting of ideas, developing new ideas and the pursuit of knowledge and truth. Intellectual curiosity really uh, fuels the, the, this, this search for knowledge. We see that today, of course, the, 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 the dominance of, of intellectual uh, curiosity in all of this. And it's also about how we can rattle what I can refer to as conceptual iron cages. You know, the ones that really uh, has a hold on us. The way that uh, uh, in, my, in my generation, we, it was unthinkable to think of Europe without East and West. Uh, that kind of uh, iron cage of... Uh, of, uh, of how we see the world. So um, I think the Peter Seder Center is also about rattling those cages. Um, it's the strong meeting of strong ideas and developing new ideas. And it's uh, also not a trivial thing. I, Victor Hugo uh, is reported to have said, um, stronger than any army is an idea whose time has come. And that is um, uh, more relevant now <laughs> than, uh, than ever. With, uh, with what we see of global developments, of tensions and threats to international collaboration, we see the inclination to withdraw behind national borders. So, all the more important to have a centre like the Peter Seder Centre. And I, I, from today, I think we should, from now on, categorise the Peter Seder Centre as an inspirational stimulus, uh, as we hear today. And such uh, arrangements, they do not happen by themselves. This is not prêt à porter. <laughs> you can't buy, buy it for, uh, off the shelf. And it, it requires people like uh, Liv, and it requires people like Trun to make it happen. And I would like to express our gratitude also to the um, to, uh, University of Berkeley for its openness, 
for its, what I would say, relaxed excellence and elegance. And I also would like to uh, uh, extend my, my, my gratitude to the supporters in the, in the Norwegian government with the ambassador. And not the least also to the Norwegian institutions that actually managed to cooperate on this. That is not also a given. So uh, congratulations also to the Norwegian member institutions. Congratulations for past achievements. And we are cheering for ideas to come and the impact that will have on society and on our minds. So, Haya uh, Pedesetir. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, also, for your inspiring and uh, very thoughtful uh, closing remarks. And now the 10th anniversary has come to an end, um, and uh, I hope you have uh, enjoyed it. I hope you have learned something. Um, and I just wanted to take the opportunity now to thank everyone who have participated in this celebration. To the Chancellor of UC Berkeley, Carol Christ, to the Prime Minister of Norway, Jonas Gard Støre, to the Associate Vice Chancellor of Research, Linda Rugg, here at UC Berkeley, and also to the Norwegian Ambassador to the United States, um, Anneken uh, Ramberg Krutnes. I want in particular to thank the 12 presenters of research projects. I have to say, I, I found them singularly interesting, very inspiring and very engaging. And I felt I just learned so much that I sort of didn't know before. And I guess that's a measure of a successful event. Um, so thank you again. Um, I also want to thank everyone who's been present here, physically here, but also remotely in California and in Norway. And um, I want, want to hear in particular point out one person uh, to great joy showed up here, and that's John McKee, sitting back here. And, uh, and John McKee has been a key person at UC Berkeley from the very inception. He started working with Leave to craft this idea. I worked with him. John and I also worked with the then Dean of the Social Sciences, Carla Hesse. She was the chair of the, or the co-chair of the executive committee of the Peter Seder Center for, I think, eight years. So um, I'm just incredibly pleased to see, see John here. Um, then just as a final thing, uh, an event like this, requires a lot of support. And I have to admit, I didn't quite understand how much support it requires. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank uh, really the lot of people who contributed, and really from the Institute of European Studies. First of all, Akasemi Newsom, its executive director. <laughs> And then a bit more in the background, Ray Savord. I just met him this morning, but he was amazing. And uh, a round of clap, clap for him. Then we've, we've gotten wonderful support for our global engagement office. Uh, more than I could ever have hoped for. And Ashley Spinelli has been the key person there, the director of the office. So a round of support for her too. <laughs> And I, I also have to say that I, over known over several years, in fact, um, from University of Bergen, the sort of the counterpart there, Anette Katinka Sadvam. And so, <laughs> clap for her. And I also have to say she has the unique distinction of having been a visiting student here at Berkeley in 2009. So I hope we did something good for her and taught her something that she found useful, useful for that. And finally, I just want to say a, a warm and, and deep thank for the Consul General in San Francisco, the Norwegian Consul General, 
in San Francisco, Gry Rabe Henriksen. She put up a wonderful reception for all of us last night. So thank you again. And thank you now, we're done, um, on time. So enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>